<laughs> yeah, yeah. Zoom. Okay, so uh, what I'm working on is slightly uh, different than what we've just been talking about. I'm working in human information interaction. Uh, so what I've been looking at is testing ontology, embedding visualization for people interacting with visualizations of embeddings. Uh, and I did this as part of my master's in information science at City University of London. So the embedding tool I used was Altevec. I think uh, Pablo was talking about Edgetevec and Asiya uh, presented a lot of different embedding uh, methods. This is another one. Um, the advantage of Altevec is uh, that it's similar to Antotevec, but it also creates embeddings of metadata and it creates embeddings of logical constructors, so it preserves semantics. Um, and it has the graph structure. So OWL constructs are included in the embeddings, and that means that you can add semantics in to the information if you're going to be uh, inferring links in your graph structure. But I actually uh, wasn't using it to do any of that. I did a study with human participants, looking at how people interacted with information visualized from uh, an embedding. And so similar to what Asiya was talking about, uh, when you uh, translate an ontology into mathematical information, you have a very large number of dimensions. So you need a dimensionality reduction technique um, and PCA and TSNE are common methods that people are using right now. I use with PCA as principal component analysis which is a statistical method for taking salient semantic features and uh, when multiple dimensions and translating it down to a smaller number of dimensions. Uh, but there are also older methods from the information retrieval community that I discovered. I didn't actually test any of these methods, but uh, so some of my favorites uh, was something called star coordinates, which is an incredibly naive way of uh, doing dimensionality reduction, but it does preserve some of the uh, semantics that exist in the uh, original multi-dimensional embeddings by simply adding new axes to a two-dimensional space. So the problem you have with dimensionality reduction when you're doing a visualization is you've got all of your feature vectors, which are very large of you know n dimensions. You need to take that down to two or three dimensions so people can actually see the semantic features that you're working with in your information. Uh, so star coordinates, uh, anything you can do to make it more transparent means that you have less loss of the original semantic features that you had in the ontology in the first place. Uh, so I didn't actually test star coordinates, I just used PCA, um, which is very simple. Um, and then another thing I was looking at were radial visualizations. Um, now in the data visualization literature, radial visualizations are, are not, um, not favored. Uh, they are uh, very hard to interpret, except if you're looking at uh, tree diagrams, tree diagrams, radial visualiz visualizations of tree diagrams. When you do human interaction tests, people are, it's easier for people to navigate uh, radial visualizations of semantic trees uh, for whatever reason. So I wanted to see if you created a radial visualization of an embedding, if that would impact how people interacted with it. So I converted uh, things to polar coordinates, which added another layer of uh, potential semantic distortion in the visualization. Um, so I was uh, just did a very simple uh, user interaction test, looking at how people interact and read embedding visualizations uh, versus graph visualizations of an ontology. Uh, and the hypothesis was that graph participants would have higher precision and recall on an information retrieval task. Uh, and in order to uh, construct something that the average user could work with. I had to choose an incredibly simple domain. So I used a new tutorial ontology, the African wildlife ontology, because everyone over the age of four knows about African animals. Um, and I extended the ontology with some lexical resources uh, online of uh, animals and flora and fauna from Africa. Uh, and then uh, I visualized the data using, I uh, used Ontograph and Web Visual Owl uh, to visualize it in a graph form. Uh, these are, you know, they're protege plugins for both of these tools. They're very, they're just, in, everyone uses them. Uh, Ontograph, I used uh, for it to be, a, to have the tree diagram. For web visual, I wanted to use, a, it creates a less directed graph. And then uh, I took Al to back and visualize the data in both uh, polar and Cartesian coordinates. And you can see in the pi wedge on the right, that's a big, uh, participants were given a very large image file and they could zoom in and look at where all the terms in the ontology were scattered 
in this uh, projection. So that's, uh, that's again what I was just describing when I uh, talk about circle vis and square vis. That was the radio visualization tool and square vis was the uh, visualization tool with Cartesian coordinates. And this is just an example of what it looked like. You aren't really able to read any of the terms here, but you see there's sort of a scatter plot of terms in your ontology in a geometric space and users were able to navigate and see and, and supposedly, um, you know, the logic of embeddings is that terms that are closer together have more semantic similarity. Um, and this is what Altovec is supposed to generate. Um, there are a lot of factors that can in, uh, distort that, and not least of which is the dimensionality reduction. There's a lot of feature loss that happens when you do that. Uh, I recruited my participants with Amazon Mechanical Turk and collected data with a Qualtrics survey. Uh, and the task that participants were given was to list all of the animals that they could see in the visualization. So I kept it as simple as possible. Um, and the results uh, were a little bit surprising. Um, I found that tree visualizations performed the best, uh, but the uh, embedding visualizations actually performed better than web visual owl, which was not what I was expecting. Um, and the uh, Cartesian visualization was slightly better than the radial visualization, which I, was, uh, which I was expecting, but only in terms of precision and recall, they were about the same. Um, so that was, uh, was slightly surprising uh, results. I was not expecting the embedding visualizations to perform better than any of the graph visualizations and how people interacted with them. Um, and so what I'm looking at in the future uh, as I go forward is uh, semantically labeled axes. So the embeddings actually have a very long prehistory before uh, word to vec happened about 10 years ago that goes back in the information retrieval community. And back in the 60s, the big debate with embeddings was about whether you should uh, semantically label feature vectors, which was uh, the work of Charles Osgood was a, was a big controversy. And if you are supposed to uh, label your axes, how can you do it in a way that's not arbitrary? So in terms of if you, you know, if you have an embedding visualization, you lose a lot of features. So people aren't really able to see uh, quite as many dimensions in your data. If you have some kind of semantic labels that correlate to the metadata, you can have ways, uh, there was a, an interface built called Dustin Magnet in 2004 that allowed people in information retrieval to manipulate document embeddings by creating sort of magnets in a space with terms and the metadata terms would attract data points. So if you have semantic axes, you can uh, create ways that you can geometrically explore data in uh, better ways. And um, something else that I'm interested in looking at is ways to make the process of generating embeddings more transparent. Mm -hmm. I think Asiya was talking a little bit about um, how people use matrix algebra and graph theory to perform these transformations. In NLP, when people are uh, using word to vec things are less, um, less transparent than some of the older methods from graph theory. So uh, some, of the, some of the information in the, the semantic data is lost. So finding ways that you could use uh, more graph theoretic methods of creating embeddings could mean that people could perform geometric operations on information and then translate that information back into a graph. And so that is uh, the area of research that I'm hoping to look into further now is create interfaces where people can perform geometric operations that are semantically aligned, and then you can create a new graph from that. But the newer methods uh, from word that have been come from word to vec are less transparent, they're more opaque. So that is uh, the future directions I wanna take that to. And I just wanna say thank you to my supervisor, Ernesto Jimenez Ruiz, and uh, also Lynn Robinson and David Bodden, the directors of my program. Thank you. Well, so I see two major uses, and you can you know, correct me if I'm wrong or if I leave anything out. Um, one is for like machine learning model builder teams that they can understand the embeddings that they're subsequently potentially using in the machine learning task. And the other is, is there any application to explainable AI for the end users? So the question was that there are two. Uh, main uses for embeddings. One is for actual use in machine learning, like link prediction in a graph, and the other is for end users for visualization. Um, is that correct? And yes, I think that's broadly for embeddings. 
uh, especially embeddings of knowledge graphs. Those are the two main use cases that people have been applying them to. I think that visualization is underexploited um, because it's uh, relatively simple and also people do it just to sort of get a, a picture of a data set. But when I've done visualizations for people who have large knowledge graphs, it's not always useful what you can infer from that. It's usually just presented as an image of, oh, look, here's, here's the visualization of the knowledge graph. Oh, isn't that great? But you, when you look at how, you know, you can't really, you can't really infer semantic relations between, between nodes just by looking at it. So I think that that's, that's an area in which by making them more robust way, in ways I was talking about with dimensionality reduction and things like that, that could be improved, definitely. Yeah. So you confirmed something that I have long suspected that visualizing or making nice pictures, pretty pictures of uh, these large graphs are pretty much useless. It's mm. good for a photograph or something, mm. something like that. But to, to really use or understand a graph, you have to create views of it. Mm. And one of the things that you, I think, mentioned was that a tree view was performed better than any of the other one. Mm. And it kind of shows that we, we humans think more linearly. Mm. And when the dimensionality increases, like when you have a graph that's off, you know, going off in all directions, it's really difficult to comprehend what's mm. uh, going on. Mm. So is there a way to take uh, these graphs and automatically provide uh, views that uh where you can say i want from here to here in a graph and view mm. the paths along mm. so things. so the question was uh seeing as the tree visualization performed better than other visualizations uh, is there a way to create a small view of a graph rather than trying to create a view of the entire graph um and there are i can't remember the names of the tools that do this off the top of my head but someone in the 90s was building tools that did that. And what they would do is they would uh, make it so that you're really just focusing on uh, like a few nodes, a few nodes, and then you'd have sort of paths uh, going off in the periphery and you could navigate. It was, I think it was called Zoomable Tree or something. You could navigate and the interface would shift with you as you navigated through. So it was much more like walking through the graph um, and as you walk to a new node, the whole thing would shift. So, uh, but I guess if you mean like taking a view of a, like a specific part of the graph, do you mean like running a, a query or something and then creating a visualization of that? Like if you were to, to do like a Sparkle query or something, or do you just mean like just take a, a view of a section of the graph and navigate it? So a lot of times, right, you, know, you have a large graph, right? You want to know how two points connect. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Useful to trace the path of the tree because you're looking at it at the graph. It's, it's, it's simple yeah. To tell. Yeah. So I think that the I can't. I unfortunately I can't remember the name of this tool, but there are tools that where they what they would do is they basically restrict the pane, and then you'd see like a few nodes, and you'd see the edges going out, and then as you navigated, the pane would sort of shift, and you'd be moving through. And it was uh, it was done in such a way where it was linearly organized, so it wasn't quite as cluttered um on the uh, on the page there's another tool that actually uses embeddings that's similar to that right now called stunning doodle that i really like where it visualizes the graph but then it also takes an embedding file and it'll show you the graph and then it'll also show you then what the embeddings say are the nearest nodes so you see both simultaneously and that also uses a restricted view that one's that one's actually very good what is it called again stunning doodle that's a great name you mean for stunning doodle yeah. you mean or oh you mean just yeah. hmm. um so i mean it's it's not uh the visualization i was talking about uh the the tree visualization that was made 30 years ago is not necessarily like you're not no, you don't know in advance which node you're necessarily navigating to. It's just sort of an exploration. What? Yeah, yeah. There's there's no. It's it's really just an explorer. It's it's much uh, much more similar. Yeah. 
So when you're talking about ontologies and, and knowledge graphs, some are more linear tree-based and some are more branchy interconnected. Mm. So the, the ontology that, that you had your participants look at, could the, the structure of that ontology have biased towards a, a you know, the, the tree finding versus the embedding finding? That is a great question. Um, and absolutely, I think not, oh, sorry, yeah. The question was, uh, did, could the structure of the ontology that I used with my participants have biased them towards the tree finding over the embedding finding? Um, I, I think that absolutely, yes. Uh, and not just uh, the ontology that I chose, which was relatively flat, but the way in which I chose to populate the ontology uh, using subclass relations created a more tree-based uh, ontology. So uh, definitely that could have had an impact and that might have biased them towards uh, the tree-based view. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, do we have an online question perhaps? You may miss them. Um, maybe some of a, online Thank you for repeating the questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. No okay. questions at this stage, Rob, no. Yeah. And last question from the audience here. There's no question. Thank you very much. Thank you.